the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Grant victory to our country over its enemies and preserve your community by the power of your holy cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you this evening. Welcome again, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Esson, for joining us. Our speaker this evening is a professor of literature and writer in residence at Magdalen College of the Liberal Arts. Dr. Anthony Esselin is a contributing editor at Chronicles Magazine and a senior editor at Touchstone, a journal of mere Christianity. And his work appears monthly in Magnificat and regularly in Public Discourse, First Things, and The Catholic Thing, among many others. Known for his three volume verse translation of the modern library edition of Dante's Divine Comedy, Professor Esselin has also written verse translations of Torquato Tasso's epic poem, Jerusalem Delivered, and of Lucretius's On the Nature of Things. His book length sacred poem, The Hundredfold, Songs for the Lord, is a series of 100 lyric poems and dramatic monologues interspersed with two dozen of his own beautifully written hymns. Dr. Esselin's other books include The Politically Incorrect Guide to Western Civilization, 10 Ways to Destroy the Imagination of Your Child, Reclaiming Catholic Social Teaching, and Real Music, A Guide to the Timeless Hymns of the Church. It is a great honor to welcome Dr. Esselin to the Institute of Catholic Culture for the first time. Thank you so much, Dr. Esselin, for joining us. Thank you, Peter, for, uh, for having me here. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about poetry and music. And uh, I want to suggest something at the outset. It was told to me by a, a, a good friend of mine who's passed away. He was a Baptist minister. And he, uh, he, he came to his ministry rather late in life. Uh, so an older pastor gave his advice to this, to this fellow when he first entered the ministry. He said, you got to watch out. Uh, it, when a church is about to go bad, said this man. The music goes bad first. That's the leading indicator. Um, and since this man had owned a gas station before he was a, a minister, he was apt to take the advice of older men, unlike young people who know everything in the world already. Um, and uh, I, I would say that that fits with my experience of things in the Catholic Church since I was, since I was a kid. Um, my friend might have not have known exactly why it was that uh, that that bit of that that warning actually is true the warning of, is a good warning it's on target uh i'll say that i i think i know why and that is that uh, uh when we're talking about the human being you can persuade somebody of the of the truth of something all day long and yet not have that person move one inch from where he was standing or sitting before because reason, unfortunately, perhaps, I don't know, or fortunately, reason or rationality is not the driver of the human being. Um, reason can perhaps provide the right direction, but it's not going to get you there. It's not going to drive you forward one foot. Imagination is the driver, okay? Imagination is the power. Um, reason maybe can hold that steering wheel and in a, in a, a, a clear-sighted way, tell us where we want to go, but the power comes from the imagination. Um, C.S. Lewis says much the same thing in The Abolition of Man. It's that part of the human person that Plato called the chest, Lewis calls the chest, who's located in the chest, the thumos, drive, um, spirit, says uh, Plato. It, it depends on how you want to translate that word. And that we have neglected, almost totally, okay? Um, even in good Catholic schools, we've neglected it. So in good Catholic schools, we typically find that the kids have really good religion classes. They may have good philosophy classes, but they don't study poetry in those schools. So the kids' imaginations are unformed by what's going on in the school. Instead, they are formed by what they watch on screen, on the computer or on the television, and they're formed or not formed at all, but kind of just turned to mush 
by the bad music they listen to. They listen to bad music outside the school and the church. Then they go into the church and listen to bad music. Um, and bad music is not a neutral thing, okay? It's, it's like a, a dinner laced with a slow working poison. It's no good, okay? It's, we should not permit what is ugly or stupid or clumsy, uh, third rate, to have any part in our liturgies at all, but we have allowed it, okay? Um, much to our harm. Um, imagination is the driver. Now, another, I'm gonna make three point, general points about, um, about good hymns tonight. Uh, that is one, that good hymns will uh, give you the power, right, to go where we want you to go, where you want to go, which is um, to increase in virtue and holiness, to accept the grace of God, to draw near to Christ. The second thing that I find when I look at um, the hymns that have been written or were written for the better part of 2,000 years by Christians until the last 40 or 50 or 60 is that they were really steeped in Scripture. And I don't mean that they took a couple of verses from Scripture and then just used them as a mantra, okay? Instead, what I mean is rather what we heard from Father Ezekias earlier, okay? That is, you, you understand that when St. Peter was talking about baptism, he was also talking about um, Genesis and the flood. Uh, he's thinking about the fact that Christ rose on the day after the Sabbath, the eighth day. All of these things are forged together in his mind. When Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about the bread of life, um, and he's probably even uh, uh, using a pun there, it's lehem lechaim um, in, in Hebrew, right? The bread of, bread of life, it's it's wonderful phrase. He's thinking about the manna, and manna means what the heck is this? And in fact, the re reaction of the, of the people in, in, that Jesus is talking to is another form of that. What the heck is this? What are you talking about? Um, well, the old hymn writers, they put all of these things together. They, they, they took a piece from New Testament, saw that it was an echo of something in the Old Testament, uh, saw it in the light of all the truths that they believed about Christ, and you end up with real theology. Um, scripture uh, leads to really firm and clear doctrine, which is the third point that I want to make, that these these hymns actually really do teach us, okay? So they drive the imagination. They are scripturally rich, far richer than anything we get these days. And they are solid in doctrine. In fact, they open doctrine up for us. You could tell a kid all day long um, that, uh, that Jesus is the bread of life, and it remains inert in his mind. It's just a notion, okay? But if you can put it into a hymn that combines Psalms with the Gospel of John, with St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians on the Eucharist, with Exodus and the manna, and you should put that all together, and my gosh, it's as if you're it's as if you've suddenly walked into a cathedral and you look above and you see these great stained glass windows, and they are all like incredibly intricate and ordered uh, whole works of art where each little piece has its place and fits in with the whole and reflects every other little piece. Okay? Um, so that's my just general harangue to begin. And I thought since yesterday was the feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross, I thought I would give you, um, this is not in the handout, this is a hymn Sometimes you hear from people that, uh, you know, what, most of the stuff that was written at any time is just lousy. We're just stuck with what's written. Now we have to sift it out. I don't buy that. I collect old hymnals, and I don't find lousy stuff. in them. I find that they range from pretty good to sublime, okay? And I often find one that I don't have in any other hymnal that is sublime, but just somehow didn't didn't catch or whatever. This is a poem called The Story of the Cross. It's to be sung as a litany, 
And uh, it begins with a section called The Question. These are very short stanzas. I want you to pay attention to how much power is packed into each little stanza. I'm going to read it through. First is the question. See him in raiment rent, with his blood dyed. Women walk sorrowing by his side. Heavy that cross to him, weary the weight. One that will help him stands at the gate. Multitudes hurrying pass on the road. Simon is sharing with him the load. Who is this traveling with the cursed tree? This weary prisoner, who is he? Now comes the answer. Follow to Calvary, tread where he trod. This is the Lord of life, son of God. Is there no loveliness, you who pass by, in that lone figure which marks the sky? You who would love him, stand, gaze at his face. Tarry a while in your worldly race. As the swift moments fly through the blessed week, Jesus in penitence, let us seek. Now comes a passage called The Story of the Cross. You're all, you're all brought in, aren't you? Nobody's moving out there. On the cross lifted up, thy face I scan, scarred by that agony. Son of man, thorns form thy diadem, rough wood thy throne. To thee thy outstretched arms draw thine own. Nails hold thy hands and feet, while on thy breast sinketh thy bleeding head, sore oppressed. Loud is thy bitter cry, rending the night, as to thy darkened eyes fails the light. Shadows of midnight fall, though it is day. Friends and disciples stand far away. Loud scoffs the dying thief, mocking thy woe. Can this my savior be brought so low? Yes, see the title clear written above, Jesus of Nazareth name of love. What, O oh my Savior dear, what didst thou see that made thee suffer and die for me? Now comes the message of the cross. Child of my grief and pain, from realms above, I came to lead thee to life and love. For thee my blood I shed, for thee I died, safe in thy faithfulness now abide. I saw thee wandering, weak and at strife. I am the way for thee, truth and life. Follow my path of pain, tread where I trod. This is the way of peace, up to God. Now the finale. Oh, I will follow thee, star of my soul. Through the great dark I press to the goal. Yea, let me know thy grief, carry thy cross, share in thy sacrifice, gain thy loss. Daily I prove my love through joy and woe. Where thy hands point the way, there I go. Then lead me on year by year, safe to the end. Jesus, my Lord my life, king and friend. That's what people used to do. They used to write really fine poems that were set to music for people to sing. Okay? And that is what we have not done for 60 years. Okay. Part of that is that we've lost the art of poetry generally. Nobody knows what poetry is anymore. Nobody reads it. Modern poetry lost its audience decades and decades ago. But that is a very fine poem. 
by an ordinary fellow, I cannot find a single other poem written by that man. But you were all brought into the story. I know you were. I can feel it. You were. Imagine singing that, and by the way, it is set to an absolutely haunting and simple melody, but it's haunting. Imagine singing that. Imagine singing that on Good Friday. That's what it was for, for a litany for Good Friday. You'll never forget it. You have that in your heart for the rest of your life, okay? Um, this is dynamite. And I say this to people generally, not just when I'm talking about sacred hymns. If you are teaching your children at home and you are not employing great poetry, which can be read very quickly, this is not, I didn't have to read 600 pages. It didn't take me eight, eight days or eight weeks to read. If, if you are trying to bring your young people up and you're not using poetry, that's like trying to dig a tunnel through a mountain with a pick and a shovel instead of using dynamite. Well, poetry is your dynamite. Find it, use it, okay? I'll give you another example of what the poets used to do. Now, this is, in a, this is from a hymn that you might know because it is now included in, in most of the Catholic hymnals. But in all of the Catholic hymnals that I see, uh, perhaps not the Adoramus hymn, but in all the others, it's been butchered. Um, a stanza is missing, and they got to get rid of the, uh, a little bit of the old language. And in doing that, they wreck the rhymes, they wreck the lines, they turn it into something stupid. Okay? Um, it's like somebody saying, oh, you know, you know, that funny smile on the Mona Lisa there. I really can't figure out what she's thinking. Uh, I, I'm going to revise it. Um, I'm going to put a smiley face on it, and I'll make it quite clear for everybody. Yep, yep, yep. Um, that's what the editors of your, your hymnals have done. They, they're vandals, okay? They, they're vandals, uh, and they have, they have no taste. They don't know what they're doing. Um, so even though you might have heard this hymn before, you've heard it in a mangled version, uh, it's the king of love my shepherd is, okay? And... Um, I am going to, uh, I thought I had it right with me here, but I have it in my memory right now. So this is a poem now that is a paraphrase of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want, right? But the author does what Christian poets used to do for 1950 years. He takes that Psalm and he combines it with other places in scripture. Basically, he's reading that psalm again, but in the light of the New Testament, okay? And in the context of the Eucharist. And then all at once, the psalm becomes something that David himself could never have imagined. So I won't, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, recite it through, or I will recite stanza by stanza, and uh, I, I, since I can't see the participants here, I'll, I'll, ju I'll answer my own questions, unfortunately. But um, in each stanza, there's the, what the author has done is to change the words in the psalm a little bit or add something that shows that we are now looking at this from the light of the Gospels. So it's the king of love my shepherd is. His goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Now, the king of love, that's different from the Lord is my shepherd. That addition there is from the light, from the light of the New Testament. Um, God is love, says St. John in his first letter. It's the king of love, my shepherd is. Okay, well, that's, that's a small change, right? But well, now we move to the second stanza. The second stanza um, uh, translates what in the psalm was, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. By the still waters he leadeth me. Uh, he restoreth my soul. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, uh, where streams of living water flow. 
my ransomed soul he leadeth, and where the verdant pastures grow with food celestial feeding. Nobody writing our hymns has done anything like that in 60 years, where streams of living water flow. Where's that from? Gospel of John. But not when he's talking to the uh, Pharisees um, and his disciples about his body and blood. That comes from the moment with the, the instant with the, the instance with the uh, woman at the well. She's thirsty. I have living water to give you. If you drink this water, you will never thirst again. And so the poet has added that there's just one little adjective it goes right by where streams of living water flow. My ransomed soul, he leaded. And there's the word ransom. Um, so not once we're not talking just about any old streams of living water. My soul has been ransomed. And where the verdant pastures grow with food, celestial feeding. It can only be the Eucharist. It can only be the body of Christ. But the, what the poet is essentially saying is that that is what David in the psalm, he didn't know exactly, but the Lord inspired him to write such words that wouldn't attain to their full meaning until the whole gospel, uh, until all the New Testament had been finished. Okay? The next stanza, the next stanza is a fascinating one because um, what, what we, we do here is to take one verse from the psalm and apply it to a whole parable that Jesus tells that is also not in uh, the Eucharistic discourse in the sixth chapter, but rather is, it, it's, it's how we look upon Jesus, one of the classical ways to look upon Jesus. So this translates the, the verse, um, he maketh me to walk in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And instead, the poet says, you know what? I wasn't walking in the paths of righteousness at all. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed. Your hymnals don't like the word perverse. I don't know why. Maybe that reminds them of some cardinal of, uh, from uh, Washington, D.C. I have no idea. Uh, but perverse has its old meaning of stubborn, headstrong, okay, mulish. And that's what we are in sin. We're perverse. It also literally means off the track, gone wrong. Okay, perverse and foolish, oft I strayed, and yet in love he sought thee, and on his shoulders gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. Okay, it, it, the writer of this um, stanza expected the people singing it to be thinking. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And all at once we've got a confession of sin and the whole parable of the good shepherd. Okay. Um, and Jesus also saying, which of you, having one sheep gone astray, does not leave the 99 and go seek the one in the desert? And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders, right? Um, fascinating, okay? Brilliant. The next stanza uh, translates the famous one, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, by the way, in your New American Bible, they suppress that whole idea. They suppress most of the poetry in our lectionary, unfortunately. The Hebrew reads shadow of death, valley of the shadow of death. That's what the Hebrew says, okay? That's very powerful. So it's not just, I was walking in the dark valley. I was walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Okay? Beautiful, beautiful verses, which our Bibles mess up. But now look at what the poet does in this song. In death's dark veil, I fear no ill, with thee, dear Lord, beside me. Thy rod and staff, my comfort still. Thy cross before to guide me. What he's done. It's amazing. Okay? He's just so quietly. He's not a professional poet. He wrote a bunch of hymns. The guy wrote a lot of hymns. But look, 
this is wonderful. The wood of the rod and the staff of the shepherd is now the wood of the cross. He doesn't even have to say that explicitly. It just is. Thy cross before the God. Next stanza is, is uh, often omitted, uh, but it's a really nice one because it's so sacramental. Um, thou, it, it translates this verse from the, from the psalm. Uh, thou spreadst a table before me in the sight of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Okay. Um, the poet understands that my enemies there, it doesn't really have a place in what he's done. Okay. However, he looks at the oil, the table, the oil, and the wine. And he says, these are all sacramental, including the oil. Okay. Now, believe it or not, this, uh, this poet who was not a Catholic, he was an Anglican, he was reading the Bible translated by Jerome, too. He was reading the Latin Bible. And in the Latin Bible, in the Latin Bible, if it's translated from Latin, that my cup runneth over is, uh, I am inebriated uh, by, by your chalice, okay? So the poet says, I'm going to put them both in there. And this is what he says. Uh, Thou spreadst a table in my sight, thy unction grace bestoweth. And oh, what transport of delight from thy pure chalice floweth. So your anointing bestows grace. Thy unction, grace bestoweth. Um, that's the anointing of the sick. That's the anointing in baptism and confirmation. It bestows grace. And oh, what transport of delight from thy pure chalice floweth. If you're transported with delight, you're carried away. You're drunk. You're drunk with delight. And then he winds it up as the, as the psalmist winds it up. The psalmist says, um, um, uh, my cup runneth over. Uh, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The poet just now returns to the first stanza. And so through all the length of days, thy goodness faileth never. Good shepherd, may I sing thy praise within thy house forever. Okay? That's a hymn. All right, uh, I'm going to exit my full screen so I can put up on my screen what we have now, okay? So this is um, by uh, Mr. Rory Cooney called Bread of Life, all right? The, 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 imagine now this, the, uh, and try, I, I don't mean to... Uh, um, rag on 14 year old boys or 15 year old boys, but your hymn has to pass the 15 year old boy test. The 15 year old boy is gonna roll his eyes or scratch the back of his neck and say, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Um, you, you gotta get rid of it. And this is one of those, right? Bread of life. This is the refrain. I myself am the bread of life. You and I are the bread of life, taken and blessed, broken and shared by Christ, that the world might live. Well, you know, I mean, just as English, this is terrible, okay? It suggests that, that I am broken by Christ and shared out by Christ. It doesn't make any sense. Literally, the images make no sense. And the doctrine is terrible. Look, I'm not the bread of life, okay? If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not going to have eternal life. You're going to go to the hospital and then prison, okay? Uh, I myself am the bread of life. What am I saying? I'm singing about myself. If I was the bread of life, I wouldn't bother going to church, okay? I just chew, suck my thumb. Um, that'd be fine. A stanza. This bread is spirit. I have no idea what that means. Gift of the maker's love. And we who share it know that we can be one, a living sign of God in Christ. Um, it's kind of like, uh, it's what I call piety salad. Um, you know, we get a little bit of, get a sign here and a spirit there and a gift there and love there. It doesn't make any sense altogether. 
um, it's not, it's not, um, uh, perhaps it's not doctrinally bad, um, except bread is spirit. I don't know what that means. And uh, then you sing, I myself am the bread of life. You're going to sing, I myself am the bread of life three times. Um, with the, at the first and then after each of the two stanzas. Here is God's kingdom given to us as food. That doesn't make sense. Do you eat a kingdom? This is our body. This is our blood, a living sign of God in Christ. This is garbage. This is our, this is our garbage. This is our trash. It ain't a living sign of anything. Um, it's, it's, frankly, it's gobbledygook. Um, I hope uh, uh, everybody will agree with me on that there. Um, let me give you an example of, uh, see, uh, we, what we have, the problem with us now is not just that we have bad hymns in place of good hymns, uh, if we can qualify them as hymns at all. In many ways, what we have uh, are no hymns at all in place of what used to be good and great hymns. Now, I, I said that the imagination was the driver of the human person, okay? Uh, St. Paul certainly knew it, and that's why he gives us lots of really rich imagery when he wants to describe the Christian life. So I'm looking here at the uh, end of, if I can find it, at the end of the letter to the Ephesians. Um, St. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. That's the panoplion of God, okay? The panoply of God. Um, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins skirt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and so on. Okay? This is the same St. Paul who said, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race to the finish. Well, you often won't hear that in the um, lectionary because uh, the terrible Bible translation, instead of, uh, of I have fought the good fight, which is what it says in Greek, will have I have contended well. I've competed well. What do you get? Like third prize in um, in a pole vault? I mean, what is what is that? I have fought the good fight. That that means something. Well, here here is a type of hymn that used to be uh, very popular. If you go to old hymnals, you might find a section in a hymnal with let's say six hundred hymns. You might have thirty hymns out of the six hundred. That's only one out of 20, but they would be there. There'd be a certain section having to do with just this thing, being a soldier of Christ, right? Our hymnals have none of them except for, for all the saints. And I don't want to talk about that now because they mangle it. Um, they make it as uh, little, as they make it as, as, <laughs> as unmasculine as possible and they just garble the whole thing. But that's only there because we still celebrate All Saints Day. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there either. Um, this is a, a hymn called um, Soldiers of Christ Arise, written by uh, the great hymn, not, hymn writer Charles Wesley. And yes, he's an Anglican. He's a Methodist. He's also writing in a 1,700-year-long tradition of, of, of Christian hymnody. So he's, he's thinking gee, what did they write about uh, soldiership for Christ in the third century? What did Prudentius write? You know, what's always been written? See, thinking about that passage from St. Paul, I'll just read this through. This is, is in the handout. Soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal son, strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. That, by the way, comes not from Ephesians, but from Romans chapter 8. 
we are more than conquerors. Okay? Stand then in his great might with all his strength endued and take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. Um, he's obviously reading the New Testament there in Greek. A uh, uh, hopless was a foot soldier in, in Greek armies. Um, if you are, if you've got the full armor of an infantryman, you've got the panoplion. Um, and there is the panoply of God, the full armor of God. From strength to strength, go on. That's from Psalm 84. Wrestle and fight and pray. Tread all the powers of darkness down and win the well-fought day. That's from 1 Timothy. That having all things done and all your conflicts past, you may overcome through Christ alone and stand complete at last. That's stirring. And, you know, I'm not going to sing it for you. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great hymn. Um, check out this hymn sung to the me a melody called Silver Street, okay? And then tell me that any red-blooded American boy, any red-blooded Christian boy, singing this song, having memories of singing this song, will not have something in his soul that can never really be rubbed out, okay? Um, that's magnificent. No such hymn about being a soldier for Christ has been written since I was a little boy. And in fact, if they were written, the editors of our hymnals wouldn't let them pass through because we're not supposed to be, um, we're not supposed to be military. Um, that, that, that's garbage. Jesus um, uses military imagery uh, a lot. Paul uses military imagery all the time. Book of Revelation uses military imagery, but we, we shouldn't really. We know better than God Almighty. Uh, I don't think so. Instead, we get, we get stuff like this. Now, uh, I am not blaming this hymn for being bad doctrine, but it's a lousy poem, and um, it, it. Uh, and I don't want the ladies to be angry with me. Uh, when I say that something is effeminate, I don't mean that it's womanly. To be womanly is a virtue. To be manly is a virtue. It's a different virtue. But to be mannish is a vice, and to be effeminate is a vice. So this is to be feminine in a bad way. It's sickly in its softness. It's sickly sweet. So this is called quietly peacefully. And the refrain is, quietly, peacefully, lead me back to you. Quietly, peacefully, let me rest in you. Uh, evidently, she, she couldn't rhyme. The author couldn't rhyme. In my weakness, I have strayed, drifting far from you. In your goodness, steady me, lead me back to you. That's the best that we can do. Breathe your law deep in me. I have no idea what it means to breathe a law into somebody. Plant it in my soul. We go from breathing to planting. Let your justice be my song. We've forgotten the planting and the breathing. Kindness be my goal. We've forgotten the justice. This is, this is piety salad. Yeah. Save me from my selfish ways. Keep me from my pride. By your grace, bring me home safely by your side. But there's nothing to object to there except that it's lousy poetry. It brings up no image. It's not really uh, uh, steeped in scripture. It's, you know, just kind of kind of there. If, if a nine-year-old kid wrote it, I'd say, yeah, it's pretty good for a nine-year-old kid. Loving wisdom, you alone know all I can be. That sounds like the Army's old commercials from the 80s. You, the hope my spirit seeks, come and set me free. Well, the poem has had nothing to do with uh, bondage and being set free. Um, it's just more, more piety salad. And, you know, you go back to that refrain, uh, Quietly, peacefully, lead me back to you. Quietly, peacefully, let me rest in you. Uh, that's not going to inspire anybody. Excuse me. Okay. Um, nobody's going to say uh, upon reading that or singing it or pretending to sing it, you know what? Now I'm going to go forth and I'm going to fight for the truth. Say, no, no, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of, I don't know, but, uh, you know, just quietly lead me back to you. And so on. Um, that doesn't get you anywhere. Okay. Uh, it's, if, if we want hymns of real consolation, okay, 
where you plead to God because, in fact, you are weak and you need his strength. Um, well, the old hymnals were full of those, too, okay? Um, but they're not like that. Uh, let me give you an example of, of one. Uh, and I had it marked out, and I, uh, you'll excuse me for a second. I, I took my bookmark out. This is the uh, very well-known, or should be very well-known hymn, Abide With Me, okay? Uh, and what it does is apply the, um, the scene when the two disciples are walking to Emmaus after the resurrection, and the Lord appears with them. And uh, he begins to teach them about uh, uh, the scriptures because they, he says, you're so foolish, you don't understand um, that, uh, that uh, the, the anointed one of God had to suffer and die. And he starts expounding all the scriptures and the, the day wears on and night is falling. And they say to him, um, Lord, the evening is drawing near, uh, tarry with us a while because they're about to put in at, at, a, at an inn to get something to eat. And Jesus, who had made as if he was going to go farther, does tarry with them, okay, abide with them. Uh, and he then goes in and um, he celebrates the meal, and at the breaking of the bread, they recognize him, okay? Now, um, so here's a poet who is not saying, hey, you know, I'm going to be strong. In fact, he's saying, I'm not strong. Um, I'm weak. I need your strength, right? Um, and he applies the lesson of that scene to Emma, uh, of the two disciples walking to Emmaus to the end of a man's life. Okay. Abide with me. Fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. That's great, okay? That's, that's what poets used to do. Say, you know what? They take that scene there. I'm gonna apply it to the end of every man's life. Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away change and decay in all around I see. O oh, thou who changest not, abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself my guide and stay can be? Through cloud and sunshine, O oh, abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight, and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where graved thy victory? I triumph still, if thou abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks, and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. That's what him used to be, okay? Wonderful use of that verse from 1 Corinthians. Where is death's sting? You can afford to be defiant because Christ has won the victory. Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Um, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Uh, who like thyself my guide and stay can be. The fifth stanza, the last stanza, is um, liturgical, okay? Because if you're on your deathbed, the priest, if you are conscious, will hold the cross of Christ before your eyes. And if you can say the prayer, you might pray the prayer of Compline. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Okay? The words of Christ on the cross. So he's now asking Christ, to hold, to be the priest 
holding the cross, the crucifix, before his closing eyes. Um, that moment when I'm about to die, Christ be with me. You be the priest. You hold the cross before my eyes. So that I can say with you, in manus tuos, Domine, commendo spiritum me. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Then it will be shining through the gloom, pointing to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee in life. In, and the last line just sums up everything. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. Okay. Uh, of course, he even... Um, uh, uh, if you get that hymn once in a while, it'll probably be butchered by the editors of our hymnals. Um, I hate to have to say that all the time, but it's true. If you look at the bottom of the page in your hymnal and you see the abbreviation ALT period, it means that the hymn has been altered. Okay? Um, if you find weirdo rhymes, you can, you can all, sometimes you can guess it's like, there's like, like editors have fingerprints or something. You can see, ah, that business there, it could not possibly, that line could not possibly have ended with you. It had to end with the. And that means that the previous line with which it rhymed had to be very different too. I wonder what it really was. And what it really was was some poetry and what it is now is, is um, you know, trash, uh, gobbledygook, okay. Um, Going on to uh, another hymn here, so I have a little bit of time, okay? Um, I notice when I'm praying the hours, uh, I, I notice that the hymns that Christians used to write uh, back in the days of St. Ambrose and Prudentius and Venantius Fortunatus and the other very early hymn writers, these were these were deeply um, theological hymns, okay? Um, they, they didn't sing about their feelings. They sang about Christ, the incarnate word, and they sang about the Trinity. Those were their two main subjects, right? Christ, incar the son incarnate, and his triumph over sin and death and his resurrection, right? And the Trinity. And often, the uh, hymn, even when it was not about the Trinity, would have a final stanza uh, that we now call a doxology, which means a, a statement of glory, a glory word. And the doxology at the end would be a stanza in tribute to the Trinity. Okay? Now, you know that your, your hymnals are full of something really weird when you can't even imagine a stanza dedicated to the Trinity being put after uh, one of them, which wouldn't fit. Well, uh, for this, I've, I've picked out a couple of, of, of hymns, and I'll go to the bad one first so that I can end on the good one. Um, and I don't mean to say that this uh, author had bad intent. Well, she probably didn't, she probably didn't know better, okay? I give her the, I, I, I'll attribute to not knowing something what I otherwise might be attributable to sheer heresy. Um, this is a hymn called The Play of the Godhead. Um, the, it, it's at the end of the handout. Uh, the Play of the Godhead, the Trinity's Dance. And I see dance, and I say, uh-oh, we're in trouble here. Um, theologians do use a word, perichoresis, to describe the indwelling life of the Trinity. And um, that word inside there does mean dance. But uh, in English, uh, the play of the Godhead, the Trinity's dance, embraces the earth in a sacred romance. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, uh, what is it? So it's over the, now the Trinity is hugging the earth and kissing the earth. It's, it's really weird. With God the creator and Christ the true son, entwined with the spirit. So now we've forgotten the romance. And we're entwined with the spirit. Entwined means that you've got string all around you. Um, you're so you've got uh, you're, you're just sort of uh, all strung up together. A web duly spun. Now the only creature that I know that spins a web is is a worm or a spider, a silkworm or a spider. 
So now it's, I, I, I had a romance, now I had string, now I have a spider web, a web duly spun in spangles of mystery. I don't know how spangles spin, the great three in one. Uh, as, poem, as poetry, that's just terrible. Um, as theology, that's weird, okay? Now, stanza two, I think she was attempting to explain how we might understand the Trinity. And here we got some big problems. Um, try to tell my students, you know what? In your writing, don't try to do more than you're capable of doing, okay? Um, have you ever heard somebody trying to play the violin? You should never try to play the violin. You're either really good at the violin, or it would be better if you didn't touch it, okay? Um, there's no way of playing the violin only okay, right? It's just, it sounds terrible. And unfortunately, that's the case with poetry here. The warm mists of summer, cool waters that flow, turn crystal as ice when the wintry winds blow. Something is as crystal as ice. The taproot that nurtures the shoot growing free, the life-giving fruitful and ripe on the tree, more mystic and wondrous, the great one in three. Okay, I think what she's getting at here is that uh, water can exist in three states. That is gas, the mists of summer, water, liquid, and solid, ice. I really don't think that works as an analogy of the Trinity. Um, that's, that's a problem there, okay? Because uh, you don't have the water is ice when it's not water. The water vapor is vapor when it's not ice. But God, the Son, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, are always. And they're not three forms of the same thing either. They're three persons, distinct. The taproot that nurtures the shoot growing free, the life-giving fruitful and ripe on the tree. Now, now we've got three parts of, of one thing, and that too is a problem, okay? So it's like, okay, God is the taproot, and the shoot is Christ, and the fruit is the Holy Spirit. That's a problem. It's lousy poetry, but it, the theology is problematic, to say the least. In, in the third stanza, in God's gracious image of co-equal parts, we gather as dancers uniting our hearts. Uh-uh. Now we're, we're off the reservation and into heresy. The sun is not a part, okay? A part is not a whole. Um, a part is only a part. An arm is a part of the body. The shoot is a part of a tree. The taproot is a part of the tree. But the spirit is not a part of the Trinity. Um, it's, it's not like we put the three together and we get one, but without, we only have two thirds. That's not the way to think about this. So this is bad stuff. We gather as dancers uniting our hearts. I don't even know what that means. I did dance uniting your hearts. Men, women, children, and all living things, we join in the round of bright nature that rings with rapture and rhythm. I don't know what it means for something to ring with rapture. Rapture means that you're carried away. You're swept off your feet. Um, you're ravished. I don't know how you ring with rapture. I don't know how you ring with ring with rapture and rhythm. The only reason why rhythm is there is because it begins with an R, um, because otherwise it doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Um, now, uh, this th that I'll end with here, uh, a, a really good Trinitarian poem, which is good for Trinity Sunday. Um, you would think that somebody who's writing a poem about the Trinity would write a stanza about the Father, a stanza about the Son, a stanza about the Holy Spirit, and then one stanza about the Trinity, right? Um, so well, this is what the person does, what, what our hymn writers don't do. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise. Father whose love unknown, all things created own, build in our hearts thy throne. Ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, by heaven and earth adored, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, come give thy word success, establish thy righteousness, savior and friend. Come holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour. 
Thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, spirit of power. To thee, great one in three, the highest praises be, hence evermore. Thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Okay? That's a poem, right? Now, you might say, perhaps, that uh, uh, this is all very well and good when you could use those poetic devices that the people of old used, okay? Um, but now we've got modern English, we can't do that anymore. Well, um, in my, my book, The Hundredfold, my poem, I said to myself, I'm gonna write some hymns now, and I'll let myself use this um, old word alone. I'll yet let myself use thee and thine, but nothing else, okay? Thee and thine are very convenient, and I think proper when addressing God. So uh, here's, a, here's a hymn that, that I wrote, uh, thinking of Jesus as the carpenter, and I want to suggest that the, the same kind of motivation that, that inspired our various poets, and I was tapping into that too, right? To see so many parts of scripture combining in one, and to make, to give it form, to make it, um, to make it all unite around uh, images that you can see, feel, uh, dramatic moments too, that you might be in. So this is uh, a, a hymn to Christ the carpenter. Good carpenter, the flood is rising high. Take us within thy vessel, lest we die. All that we build is dust, as dust are we, and no salvation find except with thee. There dwells the surest wisdom in thy hands, but all our temples rest on shifting sands. Take down our pride and leave no stone on stone and raise instead a temple of thine own. Thy hands have knowledge of the strongest wood, while ours are soft and know not bad from good. The bridge's piers give way to utter loss, then span our road to heaven by thy cross. Take us, good carpenter, and do thy will. We cannot be the carved and carver still. Breathe, out, breathe into us thy life that we may be forever living images of thee. Folks, it was done for 12, for 1950 years. Uh, what was done before can be done again. Um, there is no reason why we have to settle for third rate stuff, slipshod, lousy, lousy theology. There's no reason why our children's heads have to be filled with mush. Um, we give the children the impression, especially, unfortunately, the great skeptics of the human race, the 15-year-old boys, um, that uh, that church is really not to be taken all that seriously, that it's all about sentiments, uh, kind of gushy, touchy, feely, rather queasy-making sort of thing. Um, and there's not real intellectual substance to it either. It's sentimentality. You, you, if you associate the faith and, wor and worship and liturgy with sentimentality, you've lost, you've lost that part of your audience and, and it's gonna be really hard to get them back. Um, and I, everybody else, everybody else will, will still be, they'll still be like cripples because they won't have that imagination formed. Um, all the art, what little art they're exposed to is the lousy stuff coming at them from the screen and then you give them garbage on Sunday. Don't do it. Um, you got, uh, uh, we don't have any adequate hymnals in English, even the ones that don't have garbage in them, don't have enough hymns. I'm talking about you, Adoramus, and you, St. Michael's. We need, we need new hymnals with at least 600 hymns, okay? Not just service music, but 600 hymns along with the service music. Um, we need them, we need them, we needed them 40 years ago. We needed them 50 years ago. Uh, uh, in any case, um, whatever you can do in your parishes, do. And you should also, when I say, um, when, when they do choose a real hymn, um, almost all the time it will have been bungled by editors. 
also try to insist upon getting the authentic text. Okay. Um, often it's bungled because there was a military image in it that they don't want anymore, or God is referred to in a masculine way as father, and they don't want to do that. There we're talking real heresy. Okay. Um, pay attention, though, because most of those traditional hymns, I would say 19 out of 20 of them have been, have been mangled. Okay. Um, and you want the real stuff. You don't want the adulterated stuff. So uh, I can stick around for a few questions if that's possible. Uh, all right, I think we have quite a few questions coming in here. Um, first off, actually, this came up early. Um, Dr. Heslin, could you share again the title and the author of that first hymn on the occasion of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross? Yeah, the title is called The Story of the Cross. Um, I have it in only one hymnal. It's my old, the English hymnal uh, from, I believe, 1933. Um, this is the one that Rafe Vaughn Williams worked on. Uh, it's in the litany section at the back. The guy's name, we, I, we don't even know his first name. His last name was Monroe, M-O-N-R-O. No E. Uh, first name initial was H, I, I believe. Uh, it's, it's a striking poem. It's really powerful. Um, and let, let me just suggest to you that there are, I would guess that there are probably several thousand such gems that have been completely forgotten. Here and there, here and there in all the hymnals. That, and that, I'm not talking then about other gems that haven't been completely forgotten, okay? But gems that have been forgotten. They're, it's not just one. They're probably all over the place. One of the things that our uh, liturgists could have done 50 or 60 years ago was to find them. But they weren't interested in that, just as they weren't interested in, in real folk poetry or folk music. Uh, they just wanted to do their own thing. Mm -hmm. Ray Vaughan Williams, whom I mentioned, um, he was an agnostic, but he loved music and he loved sacred music. So he actually did what I suggested. He, he combed the British Isles looking for folk melodies. And he found them and he scored them. And they, they set... Uh, uh, sacred texts to them. They set these these hymn poems to them. He found them. Okay, our uh, uh, the people have been working for for Catholics and evangelical Protestants have done the same bad things too the last fifty years or so. They didn't don't do none of that. They did none of that. An agnostic did um, and did very well. What they never even bothered to do. Thank you. Uh, here's a here's a pair of questions, just kind of juxtaposing the hymnody uh, and various hymnals that you've referenced at, uh, and their use at mass, and then the divine office and uh, and the hymns there, and then also uh, not just the divine office, um, but the various chants that are in you. So so here's a pair of questions. The first one: Could you speak to uh, the use of hymnody at mass versus the uh, the Gregorian chant uh, propers and what their place may be, um, and, and especially noting that many of these hymns, even some of the ones that you mentioned tonight, uh, come from Protestant authors. So how are we supposed to bring them into our worship in the best way? Um, and then the, the second question related, just to, to bridge the gap from the Mass to the Liturgy of the Hours then, um, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you judge the hymns that are currently in the Liturgy of the Hours? Do they suffer from the same errors? Do we need to apply the uh, same critical thought to them? Uh, okay, uh, on the first question, um, I collect hymnals um, wherever I can find them and from all of the various churches. And uh, only very, very rarely 
um, will I notice something that seems to be obviously un-Catholic. That is, you've written this hymn because you have rejected something that's in the Catholic faith. Um, the, the, the hymns that I, I gave today are thoroughly unobjectionable. Um, we might object to, uh, on the same grounds, we might object to ever singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing because it was written by John Wesley, Charles Wesley's brother, right? But of course we don't object to that because there's nothing to object to. It's a beautiful Christmas carol, beautiful thing. Um, I think that uh, when it comes to beauty and art, we should take full advantage of everything that's given to us. Johann Sebastian Bach was a Lutheran. He wrote the greatest sacred music that's ever been written, okay? Um, take a look at his oratorio, Jesu meine Freude, Jesus my joy, or um, it's, it, we've had that translated into the hymn, Jesus Priceless Treasure, which I did append in the handout. Um, that was set by Johann Sebastian Bach in this glorious oratorio mixed in with verses from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Um, it's Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, so, you know, the music of Bach was the greatest gift of the church that artists have ever given. Um, so I don't think we need to be shy about that, okay? Make full use of all of the good things wherever they may come from, right? Because almost all of them have really nothing to do with anything that separates Protestant from Catholic or Eastern Orthodox from Catholic. They really don't. Um, you'll find a great lot, you'll find heresy on every page if you want, if you really want. If you want lousy theology and heresy on every, lousy theology and heresy on every other page, um, just, just get the gather hymnal. Just get your typical Catholic hymnal. You'll find plenty of it there. Um, you don't need to uh, uh, look with a, a keen eye at something that, uh, um, that even Martin Luther might have said. Um, so, uh, so I'm not worried about that end of it. I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, now, the place of hymns in the Mass, this is a little bit beyond my pay grade. If we have the Novus Ordo Mass and we're going to sing four hymns, and I don't see anything wrong with that, okay, then we should sing real hymns and not garbage. We should take full advantage of it. This is great poetry. This is beautiful stuff. Um, look, uh, some of the great uh, uh, artists of the 16th century, the great painters of the 16th century were Lutheran. Uh, Grunewald, I, I'm not going to look at Grunewald's painting because he was a Lutheran. He was great. Okay. Make full use of real stuff. I'll tell you, though, that these hymn writers, up until very recently, 60, 70 years ago, maybe 50, 60 years ago, they took for their inspiration the hymns that they already had that stretched back to the first hymns that we have from the ancient church, Venantius, Fortunatus, and Prudentius, um, and Ambrose, and uh, Ephraim of Syria, and all these others, okay? Um, so they took them as their models, right? So the hymns that they wrote were modeled after those. And then um, in a lot of the old hymnals, in any case, for instance, in this hymnal that I referenced, um, the English hymnal, there are 150 hymns in this book that were written before the Protestant Refor Re Reformation, okay? Um, that's a lot. That's about 135 more than you'll find in the typical Catholic hymnal. So there's more medieval Catholic and ancient Catholic stuff in this hymnal by far than there is in Gather or Gather Comprehensive or Worship 3 or Worship 4. By far, okay. Um, first lines of see a lot of these a lot of these, these things are translated, and they're translated from Hebrew or, or Aramaic, translated from Latin, translated from Greek. Um, just all ancient stuff. So I would make you should make free use of, of all that. Uh, now, uh, the question about the hymns in the office. This is one I I'm not I'm not I don't know how to answer because. My breviary, I have the Baronius Press breviary, and um, it uses the old calendar, 
and um, the old sacrament, sacramentary, the old prayers. And uh, I read the hymns in Latin because the, the translation that's given in English is only a prose translation. And it's not the best sometimes. But I read them in Latin. Okay, when I'm praying them, I read them in Latin. Um, I would not trust any translation of a Latin hymn that's been executed in the last 70 years. They're just not good. Okay? Now, sometimes they're, you know, they're, they're doctrinally okay because they're just translating what's there. But poetically, they're not that good. Mm -hmm. And almost all of these have been translated before. They've been, it's not like we don't have any translations of these big hymns in the office. We have them. They just don't want to use them anymore because they might use thou and thee or something. But we have them, and they're a lot better. Um, this book has plenty of them. This, this, this hymnal that, I've, that a lot of my hymnals have. So uh, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, uh, you might be, you know, you might, have to, you might have to do a search online for the authentic text for an older translation of that particular hymn. You search by the first line of the original text, whether it's in Latin or Greek. Um, then uh, you might find a text, but be aware, sometimes when you do this search online, you will be directed to a revised uh, text. That is, it's already been, it's already been vandalized by an editor, okay? Um, you can't trust even if it says translation of, you can't trust that it re really is, that it hasn't been, um, hasn't been bungled. Uh, I happen to know these things because I know what the translation was. So I see this for you. I say, no, that's not what it was. That's not, that's not how the great translator did it. John Mason Neal would never have written that line. That line is too lousy for John Mason Neal to have written. Um, anyway, th that's as much as I can answer there, I'm, I'm afraid. Thank you. We've got, we have a ton of questions coming in. Let's give me some more. This line. Yeah, so unfortunately, we only have time just for this one. I'm going to try to combine. I mean, this, this is a, as, as you probably expect, <laughs> given your topic here. Um, although no perfect hymnal exists, of course, uh, what hymnal would you recommend for a parish wishing to begin to uh, introduce traditional sacred music back into their liturgy? And then if I could just add on to that, um, what, what else could the average parish layman do to affect this situation? Well, uh, short of kidnapping um, the music director and uh, sending them to uh, Venezuela, uh, what can you do? The, I'll tell you what, my pastor in Rhode Island when we lived there, I'm sorry, pastor for many years, uh, he used two hymnals. One was worship, which we didn't really care for that much, but he only chose the traditional hymns out of it, but unfortunately had to deal with the mangled uh, texts. But uh, about two thirds to three quarters of the time, he used what for my money is the best hymnal in English, in existence, in print. And that is the 1940 hymnal. Hymnal 1940. It's done by the Episcopal Church in the United States, and it was issued in a reprint in the 80s. The reprint was not a revision. Um, it was a reprint, but with about 70 additional hymns in a supplement in the back. Um, so it's basically the, what the 1940 hymnal was, plus another 70 hymns. Uh, that's the best English hymnal in existence that I've seen, okay? Um, and it's got everything, it's got everything. Uh, and I don't really believe that there's any, that there's any at all in there that, that would be uh, objectionable theologically, okay? There's, there are a lot more, by far, a lot more ancient and medieval hymns in that hymnal than there will be in any of your typical Catholic hymnals. We're, we're talking, there might be, there might be a hundred and, 110 such in that particular hymnal. So that there's 150 in the one I, I talked about today. Um, it might be about 100, 110 in that one. 
maybe you get 10 or 15 in your typical Catholic hymnal now. All right. Um, and that's just, that's uh, Middle Ages and, and, uh, and, and earlier. Then there are plenty of hymns after the Reformation that are in there that are written by Catholics. Okay. There are hymns in there written by Catholics. And there are hymns in there written by other Christians, but that are not, it's nothing in them. Abide with me, there was nothing in there. You said, oh my gosh, Catholic can't sing Abide with me. Of course you can. I can't sing Hark the Herald Angels sing it. Wesley wrote it. Of course you can sing it. Okay. So it's hymnal 1940 in the reprint that they issued in the 80s with supplemental hymns. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, we'll definitely have to dig up a copy, copy for the office here, too. I want to take a look at that. Uh, all right. Well, that's all the time that we have tonight. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Esselin, for a wonderful presentation. Um, we'll have the recording on our website shortly along with these resources uh, and that, of course, the handout that's already there uh, for you all to review afterwards. So thank you again for joining us tonight. We hope to see you on Sunday. Uh, and I'd like to close in prayer because it is the uh, Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. So if you'd all join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. I uh, hope to see you soon. God bless. Bye-bye.